Lord, adjust our perspective to see you as greater and more valuable and worthy of all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength this morning. Through your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, you can open up to 1 Peter. Uh, 1 Peter was a letter written by Peter to the church, and this morning we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, We're going to read verses 3 through 9, but we're actually going to focus primarily on verses 6 through 9. But um, let's go ahead and read, I I think we probably have, uh, yes, we have it on the screen as well if you don't have your Bible. So let's read together. 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now, for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to be may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And honor, uh, though you have, verse 8, sorry, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So Peter wrote this letter to the church. He wrote this letter to the church that was active and living at his time. And he wrote it to people who are just like you and me. If you're a Christian, if you're following Jesus, um, he wrote this to people who are endeavoring to follow Jesus, living in this world. And Peter, throughout his letter, talks about this idea of being an exile, being a sojourner. So we're following Jesus in this world that is not our home, right? And in this world, they're experiencing trials. They're experiencing hardship and pain and suffering. And Peter is encouraging them, and Peter is encouraging us to keep our eyes and our minds on Jesus and our true home in order to put the difficulties of this world in perspective, as we walk through. See, for us, we are exiles. If you're following Jesus, you're in exile. This isn't your home. That's part of our faith. We're exiles in a culture that idolizes comfort and pleasure. Any disagreement? I know I know even for me, that's I love it. I love comfort and pleasure. That's pretty much the opposite of pain and suffering, isn't it? trials and difficulty and that's why we spend billions as a nation every year to avoid it to avoid pain to avoid suffering and cover it up with entertainment and food and activities and alcohol and drugs and sex and porn and anything that we can get our hands on or give our lives to or or cover so to speak those things that bring pain and suffering into our life It's almost as if our entire life in this culture is built around trying to flee from and avoid anything painful. But as followers of Christ, we're called to something different. That's what Peter is getting at. For Christians, the struggle is no less real, right? But what's different for those who follow Jesus is that we will never suffer alone again. Never. 
And we'll never suffer needlessly. See, suffering and trials and difficulty is a part of this world. It's not just a Christian thing. It's the result of sin. It's a result of the fall. Things break. Things deteriorate. Things go wrong. That is part of this world. So whether you're a believer or not, we all face suffering. But, but as a believer, we have a hope that goes far beyond just trying to avoid pain, cover pain, numb pain. So Peter's encouragement is, remember, this isn't your home. Remember, this isn't your home. Remember, this is temporary. And remember that he is with you. God is with you all the way through. He will never leave you or forsake you. Look at verse 6 again. <clears throat> Excuse me. In verse 6 he says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. In this you rejoice, right? You rejoice in the salvation of the Lord. I mean, verses 3 through 5 are amazing, right? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. Anybody experience his great mercy? According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again, brought back to life, renewed in spirit with a living hope, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to not just brought back to life, but to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. That is something to rejoice in. Amen? But for now, but for now, life is not without trials. Now, again, I realize what I just described, our tendency as humans, and especially in our culture, to push away from pain, suffering, hardship, even hearing this, we, we want to get to the good stuff, right? Right? But isn't God kind, isn't Peter kind to be real with us? Because reality is not going to change. This is this life. This is us. In this world, struggling, right? And how kind of him to encourage us, don't worry. In Jesus' words, fear not. It's only a little while. It's only a little while. And the trials that he talks about, he says various trials. So I don't want anyone here to think. Sometimes when we, when we think of trials, suffering, difficulties in the Bible, we think of these big things. And we go through big things. And there are some of you in this room that have struggled and suffered through through things that I don't know how I would walk through, apart from the grace of God especially, but even with the grace of God, we suffer. But if you're not going through some traumatic event right now, I don't want you to think this doesn't apply to you, because if you are uh, one of his creation, and you are following him, and you are in exile in this world, you are going through difficulty and hardship. And so this could be big or small, it could be internal or external, it could be fear, loneliness, depression, personal failure, sin. Even, scripture even talks about the struggle with sin, overcoming temptation as being suffering. There's a, there's a wrestle, there's a tearing, there's a pulling that goes on inside of us or externally, being sinned against. Injustice, being marginalized, relational pain and betrayal, sickness, death, uh, persecution. You know, the list could go on and on and on. But Peter's words here are broad and vast, and it applies to all of us. And Peter's saying, I want you to see how God meets you. I don't want you to spend all your energy trying to go away from it. I want you to see how God meets you how you can grow, how you can actually have joy and confidence and courage even in the midst of very confusing life circumstances. And in order to do that, we need to know 
about the problem of pain and about the purpose of pain. Because both are true. And humanly speaking, pain is a problem. Any, any <laughs> It is a problem. But Peter, as I already said, Peter keeps it real. He, he's, he's saying, listen, you're going to have trials. And they are going to grieve you. When you hear a word like grief or grieving, that, that implies there's going to be loss. There's going to be sorrow. There's going to be pain. They're going to push you and squeeze you and test you. The question isn't, will you experience it? The question is, what do we do when it comes? What do we do when it comes? And Peter's appeal is that we trust Jesus. That our perspective enables us to look forward to verses 3 through 5 and say, that's where my eyes are fixed. This is temporary. And to remember, Jesus is with me now. He's getting me through. He's walking me through. And with this problem of pain that I'm experiencing right now, he is doing something in me during this time, which is preparing me for that time. And so he's encouraging us to lean on Jesus, to trust in him, to remember what we know to be true about our God and let that be our security and our anchor. But if we're honest, that can be very hard to do, can it? Because trials don't always come with it. It's not like you get a letter in the mail, hey, next week this is going to happen. Just want to give you some time to prepare your heart and be ready. You know, it just comes. And when you feel like the floor has been ripped out from under you, this can be very difficult. But see, here's the, here's the encouragement. I want to keep nudging us forward. If Jesus isn't what we turn to, and if Jesus isn't what we trust in when trials come, and we latch on to something else to try to give us hope or to try to get us through the pain, all we're doing is perpetuating the problem, right? It's like kicking the can down the road. The can never, actually, it's worse than kicking the can down the road because if we don't go to Jesus, which is who we were created for, and we go to something else as a, basically as a functional savior. So instead of finding comfort in Jesus, we're going to go to food for comfort. Instead of going to Jesus for healing, we're going to go to alcohol to try to forget everything that we've done. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's a functional savior. It's, the scripture calls it an idol. Well, that is going to create more problems because we're not being healed. Now, we've got the problem that's causing the pain, and we are choosing to do something else that's going to make it worse in us. God is still with us. He's still there, arms out, calling us to come back to him. But the encouragement is to go to him. So is your trust in something that's going to crumble? Or is your faith in the only thing that won't crumble, the imperishable? Jesus, who loves you. See, it's in him where strength and weakness is found. It's in him where courage in fear is found and confidence in confusion. How can you be confident in the middle of confusion? When confusing things happen in this world, how can we be confident in the middle of that? Well, because ultimately... This scenario is just a, a small piece in my eternal perspective because that's my home. And I know this is just for a short time, but I can't do that if I'm going to something else. It's in Christ that we find hope and despair and joy in the face of pain. So I can believe what the world tells me. And, and I think I've... I'm not overstepping to assume we all struggle with this. I can assume that what the world tells me is true, partially because it feels right, that all suffering is an abject curse, and that I should do 
everything I can to get away from it, to escape, to numb, to distract myself because my comfort is the greatest good. Again, the problem with this pain is that that doesn't work. It makes it worse. Or I can believe what the Bible says, that suffering is real, it's grieving, it's painful, it's difficult, it's also a problem for us. But it also has the potential, by faith, to be a powerful force in our lives because God is at work in us and God is with us through it. And so there is a purpose There is a purpose. I want you to see two phrases in verse 6 and 7. I'll just give you the phrases. In verses 6 and 7, we see, if necessary, and so that. So that. Trials are not just inevitable. There's a necessary... There's a necessary, trials are inevitable, sorry, something happened in my notes here, there's pieces missing. Trials are inevitable, they're not just random, they're not just capricious. There's a necessary element, there's a forging and a purpose to the suffering we we experience. So the, the, the term, if necessary, in the English, it sounds like it's a question, it sounds like, well, you might need it or you might not need it. But when we go on and we talk about what God accomplishes in us and how he uses this, you'll understand if you're alive today and you're not um, uh, passed on to the next life, it's necessary. Because there's a forging that takes place. There's a purpose in it. So for us who are still here, it is necessary. And, And there's a so that. So that, you don't say so that unless there's a reason for what you just said. And so there's trials, so that, and there's a purpose. We'll talk about that in a minute. The, The point is that God's at work. God is at work. He's sovereign, he's powerful, and he will accomplish his will in each of us. So you say, how how can it be though that this is the way it is? How, How can it be that a loving God you say is a good God can allow his children to suffer. How can that be a part of his plan? And I'll be honest with you, there's a part of me that I I don't fully understand it. I mean, I can give you some theological answers, but I don't fully understand it. But I do know that he's good. I do know that his character never changes. I do know that he loves me more than I could possibly love myself or anybody on this planet love me. And I know that his will and his purposes and his affection are set on me. I know that he allowed his son to suffer. And he calls us to suffer with him. Hebrews 5.8 tells us that Jesus learned obedience through what he suffered. Isn't that amazing? Verses like that should cause us to rethink some of our definitions of what good is. Or David in, <clears throat> excuse me, David in Psalm 119 said, before, before I was afflicted, I went astray. Now I keep your word. It was good that I was afflicted, that I might learn your ways. See, I know he's good, and I know he has a purpose, even if we don't understand. <clears throat> I can remember our youngest, when she was about three years old, uh, running in the house in terrible pain, screaming, yelling, crying, with a splinter in her foot. And so I grabbed Brooke and I put her on my knee and I, I comforted her and I, you know, I did what you do as a dad and I, I, I felt for her in her pain 
and her struggle, but I also knew, you know what has to happen, right? And so as I'm comforting her, she's, she's looking up at me with those eyes of, make it better, daddy. You know, make it go away. And meanwhile, mom is getting the needle and the tweezers and the alcohol and all that stuff. And as mom is making her way over, Brooke starts to catch on to what's going on and looks up at me like, you're not going to let her stick that in me, right? Daddy, save me. I know you can make this go away. And I held her and I told her, we're going to make it better, but it might hurt a little bit at first. Right. It's not the answer she was hoping for. <laughs> and she let me know that. Um, she started uh, kicking and screaming, and as I tightened my grip to hold her down, she just switched really quickly from, I know you can save me, Daddy, to, it's on. It is every man for himself. You know what I mean? <laughs> and she's crying and trying to get away. And <clears throat> You know what's amazing? As soon as the splinter was out, she's crying, screaming, screaming. As soon as it's out, she's still screaming. She doesn't know it's out yet. And I told her, it's done. It's done. It's out. It's out. She's, it is? She looked at it. Whoosh, right back outside. Like nothing ever happened. <clears throat> Why all the struggle... Why, why was it necessary to go through that? See, because what she gained in losing the splinter was better than what she lost in the pain. What she gained in losing the splinter was better than what she lost in the pain. A three-year-old can't understand why is the person that should love me most coming at me with a needle? All the implications of infection and, I mean, you think this is going to hurt. Leave the splinter in there for 10 days, right? We all know that. But the three-year-old doesn't know that. And you, and you think if you let the illustration play out a little bit more, let's assume for fear of the needle, she left it in there. What would her life become? In order to avoid the pain in that spot, she would have to change the way she walked, right? Right? She would walk with a limp. She would walk crooked. She would still be experiencing pain. And so she'd probably try to do other things to alleviate that pain. There's things about God that we're not going to understand. We're the three-year-old. We are the three-year-old pleading, don't take the splinter out. See, church, the purpose isn't the pain. The purpose is not the pain. But God does have a purpose in our pain. And it's good. Look at verse 7. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, through the trials, pain, which is a byproduct of the trial, pain leads to proof. That's what Peter's telling us. The trial is revealing and proving your faith. It's also building and growing your faith. You're going to see as you walk through trials and difficulty and pain with Jesus that he is real, that he is powerful, that he is with you, that he will not leave you. Now, that happens at different points. And this, this, this life is a journey of this. Right? Sometimes we see that he was real and powerful in hindsight. Because the whole way through it, we don't understand. And we doubt, and we fear, and we fight, and we scramble. But as we walk through it, and we see 
Sometimes it's, it's in hindsight. He was with me. And he did this work and he got me through. It helps us the next time to remember. And we will encounter him and see him and recognize him even in the midst of the pain. And so it will grow and it will forge and it will prove the genuineness of our faith. So this, the question is, when trials come and squeeze, what comes out? Because it's kind of what, what Peter's talking about here. See, we all, we all think we know who we are, right? You guys think you know who you are? I do. I mean, I think, I, I think I'm the expert in who I am. <clears throat> That's not always true. You can ask my wife. But it's the trial and the heat and the pain that reveal the strength of our faith and the depth of our character. That's when we get to, to glimpse, to see what's really in there. And you start to th- see things that you didn't know about yourself or think about yourself. Things like weakness and pride, addictions. The, I could name a whole list of things. The scripture lays them all out for us. None of them are uncommon to man. And I want, you to hear, I want you to hear this. The revealing of those things in us, again, this presses against our reaction against pain and things that are uncomfortable. Because if there's one thing I don't like, I'm guessing you're somewhat like me, is to hear bad things about myself. Right? Anybody enjoy that? Husbands and wives? When your spouse points something out in you that isn't good? I don't have to think about it. My my inner lawyer comes out without even thinking about it, right? And I have a defense and I have a reason. And in some cases, it's been a short period of time. In some cases, it's been 30 years that it took me to go, wow, I should listen to that. Because she's right. Do we do that with anything else? What happens if your engine light comes on in your car? Are you like, what's wrong with you? I can't believe you're telling me there's something wrong with my car. No, we, we want to know what's wrong because we want it to be right. We want it to run the way it was intended to run. This is a grace of God for us. Shrouded in pain often, but it's so helpful. And this is where the gospel comes in. We'll talk a little bit more about this later, but I think our instant reaction when we are exposed to something from outside of us that reminds us of the things about us that God is trying to change, sin, characteristics that, that don't line up with the character of God that he's trying to change and others in our lives are trying to help us with those things. If we're, list, if we're living in this world and we're listening to this culture, we, we push against it. And sometimes we even push those people out when how good would it be for us and that relationship for us to listen? And we can because Jesus took care of our shame on the cross. So when I hear something about me that's not right, I don't have to experience shame because we sang about it this morning. I'm free. I am so free, ultimately, completely free to be who I am and allow Jesus to shine his light through me and then change me as he wills. It's it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy. But we are free to do that. And it is so good for us. And it's so good for the church. And it reflects Jesus and his heart. So I don't know if this ever happened to you, but a while back I grabbed my my, uh, Tervis, my... You guys know what a Tervis is? Tervis tum- Okay, it's down in Florida. Like a thermos cup. 
So, you, you know, you can't see in it. And I grabbed it and I took a couple big swigs and I started feeling some chunks in there. And so I opened, <laughs> I opened the lid and there's a bunch of floaters in there. And it was so gross. I mean, the floaters, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know what's <clears throat> the floaters were gross, but what made it so gross is I just drank a bunch of them, right? We can be like that sometimes. The floaters are in there. If I had just opened the lid before I drank, I would have known they were in there, and I could have changed things, could have adjusted. It's a nice, fresh drink. But we walk around... <clears throat> I want to make this distinction. We walk around thinking that we're all good, we know who we are, or we walk around having purposely ignored and hiding who we really are because it, it's painful, because it, it hurts to think about what I've done or what's been done to me or the th all the things that go on inside of us. When all the time, there's a splinter. There's a floater. And God loves us so much. He so desperately wants those things to be cleaned out. Not because you have to. Not because you shame him, but because it's good for you. It's good for us. It's a part of the process of freedom. Freedom is intended so that we can work through these things and then freedom leads to true freedom. Without freedom, we can't even go there. We can't read what Peter's writing here and feel good about it. But he's given us that freedom. And so this gets to the next point. Pain leads to proving our faith. Pain leads to purity. Peter compares the experience of pain to the process of being refined, right? And so God is the refiner, and we are the precious metal being refined. So when you, when you pull gold out of the ground, it's just a big gnarly hunk of rock, right? There's dirt and impurities in it, and that has to be re uh, removed. That has to be um, refined, and so the refiner heats the gold, melts it, which allows the impurities to rise and either be scooped off and thrown away or burned up. Then the gold is pure. Then the gold can be useful and it's valuable and it's beautiful. This is the process of sanctification. It's a picture of what transformation looks like. Listen, the fire is not going to burn you. The fire doesn't burn the gold. And he says you're even more valuable than the gold because ultimately gold will pass away. But not you. It's just the impurities that burn away. And that's what God is doing us, making us into something precious, preparing us for that day when we'll be with him. And so trials and pain bring purity and proof of our faith and this kind of pain brings praise. Look at verse 7 again. I'm going to skip the middle part in the um, refining description. So that the tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the truth is... This is way bigger than just right now. Our pain and our suffering is bigger than just us. What it's producing in us, what, we're, what we are um, participating in when we do this is so much bigger than just the moments we live in. It's for the glory of God. As, as we're refined and we walk through trials trusting God in this world, others are going to see. Because you've got to remember, everybody's walking through the same stuff you are. They just don't know how to do it with God. They don't have God. They don't have comfort. They're not able to be healed through the process. They're not, they're not being changed for the good. They are experiencing difficulty that seems like if this is it, 
I have to get out of this so that I can enjoy what I have now. There's no hope in that. And as you walk through it with Jesus, some will see. And some will be curious. And you have the opportunity to show them Jesus. There's an outward missional aspect to our suffering. Why? Because that's the example of Jesus. That's the example of Jesus. In, in 1 Peter chapter 2, he tells us that we've been called to this. Did you know that when you became a Christian? We've been called to this. We're called to follow Jesus, right? Mark uh, 10.45, I think it is, tells us um, he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. We're called to follow him, to give our life away, to lay our life down, to carry our cross daily. Jesus entrusted himself to God, and he suffered temporarily for a good that he knew would be much greater than the pain in the moment. And the result of his suffering was glory. Glory because he defeated sin and death and set captives free. Because of that, he's been exalted as ruler over all things. And everyone will bow and declare that he's Lord because he suffered. Because of his suffering, all who trust in him, you, me, are set free and transformed and set apart for him and being sanctified, each one will bring him more and more praise and glory. And each one of us who have been born again to this living hope, as we walk in suffering and endure pain in this world, entrusting ourselves to him, will bring him even more glory as the world sees him holding you up. Have you ever had anybody ask you that? How are you getting through this? How can, you, how can you show up and you have a smile on your face? Or in the midst of your tears, you're not giving up on everything? That's a softball right there. For your testimony. Jesus Christ in your life. Listen, if you follow Jesus, comfort is not your God. If you follow Jesus, ease is not your God. Having everything our way can not be our God. That is antithetical. It is opposite the gospel. God is our God. And God calls us to follow him and lay down our life. How do we do this? When trials and pain come, How do you begin to walk this out? First thing I would tell you is be honest. Be honest. Don't start with trying to do something like religious or good. Be honest with God. Be honest with yourself. Don't be afraid to experience grief. And be honest with God and those who are closest to you about it. Where there's grief, there is loss. There is pain. There is hurt. There is brokenness. And we need to be able to walk through that and and experience that with God so that he can bring us through it and up to see him in the midst of it. But let's not pretend it doesn't hurt. It does. He is so well acquainted with what you're going through. You're not hiding anything from him ever. He just wants you to bring it. He's waiting for you to bring it. If you worry about being too honest with God, think about David in the Psalms. Where are you, God? Where are you? How long? Why have you hidden your face from me? He never ends there, but he's honest about it. He he always ends knowing what's true about God. 
but he, he's honest about his heart and his struggle. So be honest with your God. Then look outwardly. Once you've been able to be honest and process with him and be comforted by him, get beyond yourself. In verse 9, he says, you are obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Listen, listen to these words. You are obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. That is on the heels of though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith. This is bigger than just right now. What Peter's talking about is the culmination of your salvation, of our salvation. He's talking, we need a God-centered vision of this, that one day is coming, that forward perspective that we have. He's talking about the reality of the restoration of all things. Everything being broken, being restored. Every injustice being made right. That day is coming. Do you know that? It's coming. Everything that is wrong being made right in his power. But for right now, it's just a little while. So have faith. You haven't seen him, right? Has anybody seen Jesus? We haven't seen him, but we love him and we trust him. We haven't seen that day. But if I love and trust him, I know I can love and I can trust him that he loves me enough to get me to that day when all this will be made right. So whenever you start feeling like, is this ever going to end? Remember, remember the promises of God. Take a walk in a cemetery. Every one of those people in a cemetery probably at one point or another thought, will this ever end? Will the struggle ever stop? And it did. That is this life. It's temporary. We are living for something eternal. And he will come, and he will take you, and you will know perfect rest and the absence of sin and pain and tears and struggle in his presence and and, and so ultimately what we do, if we're going to walk in this, is we come to Jesus. We, fit, we were, sang a song about it, Hebrews chapter 12, verses two, verse 2. Um, fix our eyes on Jesus. We look to him and we realize that all our suffering, not only is he with us in it, but we share it with him. Shared with Jesus. We follow this surf suffering servant. We don't rejoice because trials are good but because God will do good in the midst of them. And he does and he will. We rejoice because we share in the sufferings of Christ. And if we share in those sufferings of Christ, we know Christ's suffering led him to the cross, which led to his death, which in turn led to his resurrection and ascension. Amen? And if we suffer with him and we share in those sufferings, we share in the glory and the honor that comes through that with him. Listen, church, though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. That is our faith. That is our hope. That's what we stand on. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for your encouragement. I pray, Lord, that you would take your words and that you would instill them in our hearts. Give us peace where we need it. Give us courage where we need it. Give us healing where we need it. Give us what we need. Lord, drive us, woo us, push us to come to you <clears throat> in the midst of all of our needs, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.